Hello, welcome to The Art Channel with myself, Grace Adam, and my colleague, Joshua White. In this film, we're looking at Jasper Johns, something resembling truth at the Royal Academy of Arts in London. Johns is an American artist born in South Carolina, and his career spans many decades, including iconic works of targets and flags. He's somebody that changed the way we look at painting, changed the way we look at everyday objects. Here we're standing in front of one of John's iconic images of the American flag, the Stars and Stripes. This one is from 1967, and it's actually three panels, three canvases locked together using his very famous way of making work, encaustic, which is wax and pigment laid onto a surface, onto a substrate, with bits of newspaper in there. We're so familiar with the American flag, we're so familiar with these images, but John's is always trying to get us to look at the ordinary again through fresh eyes, to see things without making any visual or intellectual assumptions. Well, it's so open, it's so rich in meaning, isn't it? If you think of a national flag, it's meant to embody all of the history and values and beliefs and patriotism of that nation. And arguably, the American flag is the most famous one of all. It is so embedded with these values, with these meanings. But, of course, John's has taken that idea of a flag and made it into an object mm. through the copying of it, the design. The design is transferable. It doesn't have to be on a piece of canvas rung up a pole. It can be made of scraps of newspaper and this sticky, waxy and caustic that drips down the surface. I mean, it's a fascinating uh, artwork, isn't it? It is. And of course, you get into these um, really interesting conversations about whether it's a painting of a flag or whether it's a flag. Yes, it functions yes. on both levels. And he's working through the 1950s and 60s on these images. This is from the late 60s. America is a, a politically um, tumultuous place to be. There have been uh, wars, there's um, it can have social unrest. I think Johns knows that this is obviously going to evoke um, high emotion in his audience. There are so many, as you say, so many associations. Well, it's both neutral and factual and material, but also it carries this huge weight of history and of uh, national aspiration. It instills hostility, but also respect. And in that way, it's a tabula rasa. Mm -hmm. It is the ultimate blank slate onto which we project our own feelings and in turn extract meaning from the design and symbolism of it. But standing here in the exhibition, you can't fail to be aware of its materiality, how it's made, this very simple, direct process of collage. It's almost like papier-mâché, mm. isn't it? It raises these quite profound and philosophical questions about signs and how they operate in the world around us. This is a great bit of stuff. This is a beautiful painting. You know, approaching sculpture, it's so kind of um, sort of chunky, it's so beautifully made and working with encaustic is pretty difficult stuff to do. So he's a real master of his craft. He knows how to use materials to give a very specific message. There's one painting that when I first saw John's work when I was a college student, there was a retrospective at the Jewish Museum in New York and there was this one painting called Painting with Two Balls. And I don't know what it was, but there was something magic about it. It's a beautiful painting of just colors and brush strokes. And then he puts these two little wooden balls in between two canvases, and you see the wall. And I'd never seen a painting in that way. You know, a painting was always a surface that you looked into. And all of a sudden, when you look into the surface, you see that it's an object that hangs on the wall. And that really profoundly affected me. And I still, to this day, love that painting. This painting is titled Zero Through Nine, and it's painted in 1961. And it's part of a series where Johns explores digits, numbers. And we attach values to numbers mm. every day, whether it's the fingers on our hands, or money we're using to pay for food. Um, they're extraordinarily useful and symbolically uh, significant. But what does he do with these, these numbers here in this painting, zero through nine? He superimposes them so that they begin to lose 
their formal structure. You can just about identify, for example, four is very prominent. You can perhaps see eight there too. But when they're superimposed in that way, they begin to disappear. Why do you think he's doing that? I think that he wants, again, us to always examine the everyday, never make any assumptions, to explore our looking and our laziness, maybe, to always come back to the ordinary. I think he's very interested in that. I think also he wants to make something that's visually engaging. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful kind of visual conundrum, isn't it? You've got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And all artists want you to stand in front of their work for as long as possible. And he's going to draw you in. And, you, you know, the human mind wants answers. So you're going to try and see if you can identify zero through nine. It's um, materially and formally quite complex, too, because if you look at how he deploys colour, the colour also blurs the distinction mm. of the outlines of these numbers. And it's very gestural, it's as if he's simulating, of course, the orthodoxy of abstract expressionism, the previous generation in New York that establishes these values of subjectivity and intuition in painting. And Johns is slyly subverting and satirizing that emphasis and returning us to, in a sense, real structure in the world, real signage uh, that we use every day to communicate with. Absolutely. He is sort of cocking a snook at an older generation of, of serious New York painters, abstract yes. expressionists, and he's existing somewhere between that and pop art. It's very irreverent in a way, and I think, you know, even all these years on, it's still incredibly refreshing, actually, really engaging. And finally, he's asking us about how we invest meaning in the world around us, in signs, how we attach those values to them. So here we're looking at a piece called Field Painting from 1963-1964. And it's it's a very exciting piece of work, actually. It's really quite exciting. Down the centre of these two canvases are the primary colours, red, yellow, blue. Also, they kind of have little hinges on them, so they lock in various objects from the studio, a beer can, paintbrush, coffee, a kitchen knife at the top. And it really brings together, I think, very, um, very elegantly, actually, his interest in sculpture, installation, found objects, ephemera, and a more, I suppose, traditional act of oil painting. This painting is so, or is it a sculpture? I mean, it's a hybrid. It's, a, it's like a Rauschenberg combine. Mm. Uh, and we can see a light switch on the left. There's an old coffee pot in the center. Uh, and he arranges the letters down the sort of vertical uh, center of the painting so that it operates like a spine from which these letters protrude like sort of growths or organic uh, vertebrae. Uh, and it, it's a painting that's really sort of crackling with energy. Mm. It's quite literally, he's invested it with, with electricity. Mm. It really is quite, it's, it's very in your face, isn't it? This is, a, this is a painting or a sculpture that asks you actually to think, well, is it a painting? Is it a sculpture? And in some ways, it's very basic. It's red, yellow, blue. He's talking about the tools of all painters, the primary colours, the start of everything. But moving into this idea of the found object, um, not quite a sculpture. I like the way that they, they fall down the centre. Uh, it almost seems like a, you think it's a spine. I think it looks like a kind of staircase. You could sort of step up the painting. And it's very, you know, it is very New York. It's very redolent of his, it's really a snapshot of his life, of his daily studio life, of the way he lives, of the place he lives. There's also magnetism, mm. because he's attaching some of these metal objects to the letters using magnets. So they're sort of suspended, defying gravity in the space. And, you know, we've discussed, you know, just that it's a really exciting, mm. uh, lively picture that presents lots of sort of questions and challenges. Art can be multifarious, it can be made in using different techniques, mm. and it can combine different materials, both the constructed and the found mm. object. And he was famously called, I think, by a Japanese art critic, uh, the only son of Duchamp. Mm. And kind of here, you see that. You see him inheriting the idea of the found object, of things being kind of partially unexplained, which I really like in the work. I mean, Rauschenberg, for example, you're looking at the flag. I mean, Johns's work, especially at this time, was very singular. And 
focused, and Rauschenberg was bringing many different things into his work. Um, at a later stage, Johns does do more of that, but he's a much more methodical, I don't mean to say intellectual or purely conceptual, it's, it's very much coming from a visual impulse, but Rauschenberg is more embrace the world and bring it in. You know, Johns is more considered about what he brings in and then what he wants you to get out of the work. And so I think that difference in personality really shows through. Johns has a kind of, you know, he doesn't want to reveal it all in one fell swoop. You know, he wants you to get engaged and get into the layers, which is one of the reasons I love his work so much. Watchmen from 1964 incorporates this curious cast of a leg placed on an upturned chair. So we get this sort of confusion, don't we, in terms of gravitational pull. It appears to be falling down mm. on top of us. Uh, and underneath is all of this sort of brushwork, different colors. Here he's arranged primary colors, blue, yellow, red. We've got fragments of lettering and stencils here, we can see R and Y. Mm. And there's almost like a quotation of a newspaper. And on a shelf that protrudes outwards at the foot of the painting is a ball uh, against which leans a plank of wood. It's, it's a weird painting, isn't it? Stroke sculpture. But the story is that Johns had come to London on a visit and been to Madame Tussauds, mm. the, uh, the waxwork museum, and he'd seen all these strange casts of bodies. Interestingly, it was made in Japan, and the reception there, or the perception of the painting, was that this was part of a body that had been blown apart. Um, this is not, as you say, what John's meant. It was about the fall or falling. So really interesting that a different cultural reading, depending on where the painting was shown, where it was received. But I think it's a really fun, it's a terrible word to but it's actually quite a nice, irreverent piece of work, isn't it? He's cast his own body, as you say, and it's quite odd. Um, it sits quite awkwardly on the top of the canvas. It's funny and confusing. Mm and uncanny mm. got reference to the body from which of course is the instrument that makes the work the painted strokes that arranges the elements it's rough it's direct it's very kind of material there's no softening mm. it's not finished in that sort of nicely mm. polished way it makes you work quite hard, doesn't it? You have to yeah. kind of step up to the mark yeah. with a piece of work like this because it is rough and challenging and quite sketchy in a way. I think it's interesting to note that he made some notes around this painting, um, around the idea of spies and watchmen and the idea that a watchman does nothing but watch. They don't take anything home. They are as you were talking about earlier, a kind of sign, a cipher. Mm. A watchman is meant to be seen mm. to give you the idea of security, whereas a spy takes his information home and is not meant to be mm. seen. And I think in the context of a Cold War, this is quite interesting when you look at the painting in that way. And it's very consistent with John's uh, prevailing interest mm. in terms of how do we extract meaning from sort of codes, from structures, from forms of communication around us. And it's so sort of jarring and disassembled that we've got to kind of imaginatively mm. reconstruct it in order to understand it. Mm. He expects you to bring a lot to the painting, doesn't he? He's not going to explain them to you. Mm. They're never going to be sort of fully mm. formed, fully explained. So you bring all your experiences, all your assumptions uh, to the work, and he challenges them. But it's very true to life mm. because we're, going, we're having to negotiate signalling yeah. all of the time. Yeah. You know, as you walk down the street, some things will be, might be clear, mm. but is it wholly truthful mm -hmm. or real? This painting is called Between the Bed and the Clock, and it's from 1981, and it's part of a whole series of these quite famous crosshatch paintings that John's made. It's a piece in three parts. Three canvases come together into this incredibly dynamic, abstract image. There's a possibility that there's a reference to an Edward Munch painting from 1940 with the same name, which has a very beautiful bedspread pattern, very similar to this. But it is nevertheless part of an ongoing concern John's has with with abstraction and pattern and surface and colour and these 
beautifully repetitive marks. They are rich, these paintings, aren't they? I mean, you can see the brushwork, the handling of the paint. Sometimes it drips and runs. Other times it's more controlled. You get the direction of the paint applied with these chevrons, really, that interlock together to form quite kind of complex mm -hmm. patterns. Um, your eye is a little uncertain which way to move over the mm -hmm. field of the painting so that they can become a little sort of dazzling, yes. really. Yeah. I think that's, that's one of his um, beautiful trademarks, isn't it? That they are, I mean, esoteric is an overused mm. word, but where do you look? Where do you start? Are you meant to start in the top right-hand corner where he sort of references his own work with a black and white version of the same painting? And I think he has this great device of changing the scale on the painting, so the pace of it changes, the rhythm, mm. uh, the speed of it changes across the canvas. And he keeps you looking around and, as you say, being slightly unsure. I mean, there's a hint of order of a consistent or repeating pattern, but then you struggle to find it, actually, so that it begins to break apart and feel much more random and free-flowing, mm. almost as if he's making these marks intuitively rather than simply repeating a mm. motif. It reminds me of Jasper Johns' friendship with Merce Cunningham and John Cage and their celebration of the value of chance, mm. of this kind of instinct of intuition. Merce Cunningham famously was guided by the I Ching, the throwing of the dice. And so you have this sense of choreography of movement, but it's something that we're not sure in which direction the painting is actually moving. Mm. So this is a, a typically large, in, all-embracing show at the Royal Academy, looking at the life and work of Jasper Johns. He asks himself this question, what does the mind already know? And in those series, the flags, the numbers, the targets, he takes the most sort of elementary of symbols and signs and has asked us to consider what meaning is attached to them. So it's that sort of connection between what the eye perceives and what is being kind of expressed to us. Always, as you say, this appropriation of the everyday, of the ordinary, always asking us to question our looking, to question the way we see uh, signs, symbols, ciphers, everyday objects. So I think John's is justifiably uh, renowned I think more famous in the States than in the UK, mm. but a show like this brings his work together over a number of decades and his preoccupation with testing our looking. And I have to say, he moves things on, he pushes things conceptually, but also technically, he works in a very beautiful way, making three-dimensional objects, paintings, prints. I find his work to be quite kind of analytical, thoughtful, even introspective. Mm. It's interesting, the sort of connection to and contrast with Robert Rauschenberg, his great friend. They had this uh, infamous relationship for several years, and so we're clearly sort of engaged with each other's practice. But Jasper Johns' work is distinctively sort of intellectual, I think, thinking about this uh, role for art, philosophically, intellectually, but without losing the materiality, mm. the craftsmanship of the work. Thank you for watching this film about Jasper Johns at the Royal Academy on the Art Channel. You can follow us on social media for updates on our latest films, on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram.